Hello, and welcome to another edition of DDI's Productivity Webcast Series. I'll be your host, Joseph Richter. Today's topic is on SolidWorks routing, specifically pipe and tube routes. The topics that we're going to cover in this webcast include routing options, routing libraries, routing component setup, elbow component setup, pipe and tube part setups, starting a route, 3D sketching techniques, route file structure, and finally exports. Okay, first up, the options for routing. Under the tools pull down for options, we can specify for routing. You're going to find it here after backup or cover. Now, keep in mind this only shows up when the routing is added in. You can do this from the tools pull down, add ins, select SOLIDWORKS routing. There is another location to set these very same settings under the routing pull down under routing tools called the routing options setup. This is basically a wizard version of the tools options dialog box. Maybe it gives a little bit better explanation of what each setting does. Both locations contain the same information and this is where we can set things like the library locations for the routing components as well as preferences for how routing is going to behave whether or not it starts a route on the drag and drop of say a flange or various other items and we'll go ahead and review a few of these. Okay so first off I'm going to add in solders routing from the tools add in pull down I can specify SOLIDWORKS routing for the current session or every time I start up SOLIDWORKS. Then I can proceed to my tools options. And I'm going to discover that routing now has its place in system options. I can set the default library folder for my routing components. And under my component and route defaults. I can allow the creation of custom fittings, allow the creation of pipes on open line segments, and if you're new to routing, if you click on the help button, this takes you directly to SOLIDWORKS help file and locates these routing options for you. Right here, the very first one, create custom fittings. This tells you that this will automatically generate a custom configuration of the elbow fitting you're using uh, when needed. Even gives a nice little example. However, rather than bouncing between the help file and the system options dialog, I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel and show you underneath routing for routing tools, there is a routing options setup. And as I click on custom fittings, it gives me the same description that the help file did. And what this setting actually allows is SOLIDWORKS will automatically add configurations to an elbow fitting when you're using an angle other than what that elbow fitting has already. Now this is used to mimic the practice of cutting back a standard elbow to accommodate a unique situation. Now if your company does not permit cut down elbows then you might want to uncheck this option. Create pipe on open segments. This refers to when you drop in a flange, SOLIDWORK starts a route and it will preview a pipe on the end of that route stub. If you continue to draw line segments, you're going to get a preview of a pipe on every single line segment with this thing checked on. That means it will add a pipe everywhere there's a line segment, whether or not it has a flange on it. If this is unchecked and the last line segment in your route does not have a flange attached to it, then you will not get a pipe on that last line segment automatically create sketch fillets, the next one here. Basically when you're generating your 3D sketch based on the route property SOLIDWORKS will go ahead and throw in a default fillet for you based on either the elbow part that will be used here again specified in the route properties or the bend radius specified for your tube bending or the maximum cable diameter. Automatically route on drag and drop of flanges this refers to when you drag in a flange into a brand new assembly, so long as it has route connectors on it, SOLIDWORKS will go ahead and initiate the route subassembly creation and start a route from that flange you just dropped in there. 
while you're in a route, if you have this next setting checked, automatically route and drag and drop of clips. Basically, in a route, when you drop a clip, SolidWorks will generate a spline from the end of your last line segment to route through the clip. Keep in mind, this is only for use on flexible tubes and electrical cables. Minimum bend radius check. This too applies only to electrical cables and wires. Uh, basically, in the cable or wire library, there is a setting to specify the minimum allowed radius for these cables or wires if this is turned on. Now, for tubes and cables for that matter, SOLIDWORKS does perform a default check and it's looking for three times the cable or the tube diameter. And if it violates that, SOLIDWORKS will denote that to you. Update route segments for fixed length upon exit of sketch. Basically, if you turn this on, it's like turning the preview off. So if you're having no problem with performance, it might be a good idea to leave this setting off. But if you're finding that the preview is lagging and taking forever, you might want to go ahead and uncheck this. Automatically add dimensions to route stubs. This here says it's for electrical cables only, but I've been using it on tube routes. Uh, basically, this will throw in a default stub size when you start your routes, and it'll even throw in a dimension for you if desired. Slack percentage for wires and cables. This will basically increase the total length of your electrical cable uh, to take into account sagging, kinks, etc. that might occur when you're actually installing this cable. So if I put in 25%, it'll make my total wire length 25% longer to accommodate for these items. Component rotation increment. This refers to clips, elbows, tees, crosses, and other fittings that you place into a route and basically so long as that component has an axis specifically named axis of rotation then you can hold the shift key down and hit the arrow keys and that component will rotate based on this setting here 15 is the default enable insertion of empty route assemblies basically when you're in an assembly, you can insert a brand new assembly, and so long as you use a route assembly template, then SOLIDWORKS will generate a route subassembly on the fly. Text size. This will scale the text for connector and route points based on the document's note font. So a size of 1 will be 1 to 1 with the document note font. And finally, Auto naming and default templates. Basically, with auto naming turned on, whatever the default names happen to be for those route components, SolidWorks will go ahead and not prompt you for a name. If it's cleared like it is now, SolidWorks will give you the opportunity to change the name of all these route components. And finally, always use default document template for routes. So if you have specific settings in mind, you may want to make one route template and make sure that everybody's pulling from it. And back to the slideshow. For routing libraries, there is a library that's installed with SOLIDWORKS routing. It's typically located under C, Program Files, SOLIDWORKS, Data, Design Library, and Routing. It contains some routing components to get you started. And with SOLIDWORKS 2007, they added a SOLIDWORKS content area in the design library pane. In there, they've added some weldment profiles. And as it relates to routing, they've added some additional routing components for our use. And then, of course, underneath the design library task pane, there's also the 3D Content Central. And on 3D Content Central, there are links to supplier models as well as a large user library where people have made fittings that they wish to share. And with that, we'll go over into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at some of these. 
Okay, so under the design library area, the task pane, we can see underneath the design library our routing components. Under SolidWorks content, I can see routing. They've got two standards here, ISO and DIN. If I look under ISO, they've got some materials to choose from. And to take a look at what some of that in that library is, I've gone ahead and downloaded one from the SolidWorks content. I downloaded the stainless steel one from the ISO. And here they have some couplings, some additional elbows, some nipples. And in order to download this stuff from SolidWorks content, okay, you need to hold control down and click with the mouse button. This balloon will tell you that when you get there. And then finally, 3D Content Central, the supplier content. If I take a look at all suppliers, I can locate my vendor of choice maybe SMC takes me directly to their website with SOLIDWORKS models so if I wanted a fitting I'd just follow the links find the one I want specify the type run through their options I can specify download. Now, no matter how many libraries we have available to us, chances are we're going to wind up downloading some models off of the internet, maybe even some from 3D Content Central that do not have the necessary items to be used as routing components. Therefore, we're going to wind up needing to create them so that they can be used in routing. The items that I'm referring to are connector points. This helps to define the type of route, the pipe or tube to be used, and this will determine the start and termination of a route, as well as routing points. These define where to place the fitting relative to the intersection in a route path. And then we have clips and supports. These clips have special, uh, rather additional special criteria such as it must have a clip axis. This specifies where the route is going to be routed through the clip. Any component that is required to position while you're placing it requires an axis of rotation, specifically named axis of rotation. And when you're placing that item, you hold the shift key down and hit the arrow keys, and it will index 15 degrees based on the component rotation increment that we set in the routing options earlier. And with these clips, it's also required that we have a filter sketch. And this filter sketch must be named filter sketch without a space. And inside this sketch, there's going to be three concentric circles, all three circles having dimensions, specifically named nominal diameter, inner diameter, and outer diameter. The nominal diameter will specify the nominal size of the clip. The inner diameter will be the smallest bundle that this clip can accommodate. And finally, the outer diameter is going to be the largest bundle or tube that this clip can accommodate. And with that, I also wanted to mention that there's a lot of specifics here, but with SOLIDWORKS 07, they added the routing components wizard. And this will help automate route component creation by showing you what's required and walking you through it step by step. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at this. Okay, so to set this part up, I'm going to go into my routing components wizard underneath the routing tools. I'm going to specify that this is for piping. This is going to be a T. And it shows me that I need three connection points and one route point. So I'll go ahead and add a connector point. I'm going to select this face here 
I'm just going to go ahead and pick up the center of that arc and this planar face will help to determine the direction. I get to specify which pipe or tube to use. I'm going to add another connection point and I'll go ahead and use select other to pick that other face. If the arrow was going the wrong direction I could reverse the direction here. I need one more connection point. It says two connector points are present so I'll add one last one. Then finally it requires one route point so I'll go ahead and zoom out and select the origin. Now keep in mind if you do not have an origin or an arc to reference center from it is required that you draw a sketch and leave a sketch point behind to select when you're making these route or these connector points. And with that it says all the connector points are present as well as the route point is present. So if I hit next it'll tell me that nothing else is required. If I'm going to be importing this into isogen it's required that I have special isogen properties. This is an elbow. I could add a part number after that. Prompts me to save it. I'll go ahead and throw this under my references folder. I'll say yes to save. And finish to exit. Now to take a look at another fitting, one that I downloaded from 3D Content Central. In this particular example, I have one origin. And since my connector point is not going to be out here, it's required that I add a sketch. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a sketch on this face here. And drop in a point. Okay, now that I've got a sketch point and I have an origin, this sketch point is going to be for my route point. This other origin is going to be my connector point. So I'll go ahead into my routing component wizard. Specify this is for bent tubing, or rather flexible tubing. This is going to be a flange. I need one connector point, which is going to be the origin. And I need to specify a planar face for direction reference. Here again, I could select the two. And then I need to add one route point. I'm going to specify that. As well as a direction reference. Next it tells me that nothing else is required. It does give me the opportunity to add a mate reference so when I drag this into an assembly it'll snap into position. So I'll go ahead and add a mate reference here. No more items are necessary. Actually I'll go ahead and skip the isogen property for now. And as I hit next, it prompts me to save it. I'll go ahead and throw it in my references folder. Hit finish to save. Now this component is ready to be used. And now to see the routing points we just inserted from the view pull down. I specify routing points, there they are. This particular fitting happens to be part of a bulkhead fitting, therefore it's an assembly. Now for assembly routing components it's required that we add assembly connector points and assembly routing points in order to use this in our route assemblies. So from the view pull down again I'll specify routing points and now from my routing pull down I can go to my route tools and create connector points by which I'll just grab the connector point that exists at the 
part that we generated and then I'll insert a route point from my part route point as well. You'll notice that this is AC point, assembly connector point, and AR point, assembly routing point. And now to show that these routing components do not need to start life as a native SOLIDWORKS file, I have a pair of solid here that I'll go ahead and open up. SOLIDWORKS will run import diagnostics for me. Okay, so first off, to set this thing up, I need a sketch for a route point on either side. So I'll go ahead and drop in a sketch point. And I'll do the same thing on the back side. Now that I have my two points ready for route points, I can go to my routing, routing tools in the routing component wizard. This is going to be an electrical clip. I'm going to go ahead and add my route point here and my direction reference here. One more route point here, direction reference there. And now it states that a clip axis is required and an axis of rotation. So I'll go ahead and add a clip axis. So I can define this between my two route points or between a cylindrical face. So I'll grab that. One of the great advantages to using the route component wizard to do this is it names the axes correctly. So as I throw in my rotation axes, it's going to go ahead and name it axis of rotation so that this works. Likewise, clip axes so that way it works. Finally, it'll give me the opportunity to add a mate reference. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'll go ahead and select that item there. For more information on mate references, you can watch my Building Efficient Assemblies webcast. I went through that. Um, or from the help topics, just click on mate references and it'll describe them for you. Now that I've got my mate reference set up, I can hit next. And now it's ready to save. And I'll go ahead and dump it in my electrical routing library. And with that, we'll go back to the slideshow. Now there are some components that cannot be set up with the route component wizard. One of those is the elbow component and it has some special requirements as well. The things that are required for this is an elbow arc, a sketch specifically named elbow arc. And that arc must have two dimensions, a radius named bend radius at that elbow arc sketch and an angle specifically named bend angle. In addition to this, it must contain another sketch named route, and this route sketch must be on a plane normal to the end of the arc, and then you must have a circle to represent the outside diameter of the elbow with a dimension named diameter at the route, and finally it must have a dimension between the center of the circle and the center of the arc, and that particular dimension must be named bend radius at the route sketch. And we want to link this to the bend radius from the elbow arc in the first sketch. And finally, to generate the part, we must use a sweep feature uh, utilizing the route for the profile and the elbow arc sketch for the path. We can use thin feature or we can use a shell to specify the wall thickness. And finally, you're going to need to add two connector points at the end to help define the type of route, the pipe and tube to use, etc. And with that, we'll go into SOLIDWORKS and show that. So let's go ahead and take a look at this elbow. I'm going to roll back to my sweep feature. And underneath this sweep feature, I have two sketches, the route sketch and my elbow arc sketch. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the elbow arc sketch. And each one of these dimensions must have a special name. Uh, this one here needs to be named bend radius at the elbow arc. So as I take a look at the properties here, I can see that the current name is D1 at the elbow arc sketch. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. And I'll change it to bend radius. 
and its full name is pen radius at the elbow arc. I'll go ahead and apply that. And this other dimension needs to be bend angle. As I right click on it, I can see that the current dimension name is bend angle at the elbow arc. If I needed to change it, I can click on properties and update it here. Now as I take a look at my other sketch, the route sketch, the dimension here must be named diameter as I take a look at the right click. Dimension name is diameter at the route. Likewise here, right click, that needs to be named bend radius. Right now it's named D1, so I'm going to go ahead and change it under properties. And I'm going to go ahead and put in bend radius. I'll apply that and hit OK. Now as I exit out, I think all my dimensions are set up properly, but to make sure, I'm going to go ahead and show all my dimensions. To do this, you right click on the annotations folder, show feature dimensions, and although I can see all my dimensions, I can't see the dimension names until I go into my tools options. And under system options for general, I can specify show dimension names. Now I can see my dimension names. And here I have a bend radius at my elbow arc sketch and a bend radius at my route sketch. These need to be named or rather linked together so that way when one changes, the other changes. To do this, I can hold control and grab both items, right click and specify link values, or I could double click on the dimension like I'm going to change it, and from the pull down here, specify link value, and I'll go ahead and give it a group name of bend radius. And then the other one here, I'm going to also link its value, and this time around I can choose, since I already have a group named bend radius, once I've applied that, you'll notice that each dimension has a link symbol next to it, indicating that it's part of a link value group. When you add an equation like a link value, you'll notice you get an equations folder in your tree, and underneath here it shows you your link values. And with that, I'll go ahead and roll the model forward. And as we take a look at the current dimensions that are shown, you'll notice that they are different colors. The black dimensions are sketch dimensions. The blue dimensions are feature dimensions, that is, dimensions created when you make a feature. And when setting up routing components, I haven't mentioned this yet, but it's a good idea to take advantage of configurations. That way we can use this fitting with multiple sized routes. As I take a look here, I do have multiple configurations. And anytime you're using configurations, I recommend throwing in a design table. So from my insert pull down, I can specify design table. And I'm going to go ahead and use the auto create option. SolidWorks is going to take a look at all of my configurations and pull that information into my Excel design table. If I want to spend time with this design table, you can edit it directly in Excel rather than on top of SOLIDWORKS. To do that, you right-click, Edit Table, and New Window. Then inside of here, I have better control over what I'm taking a look at. So now I won't accidentally click out and go back into SOLIDWORKS. And once I'm done here, I can just close out. And you'll notice that all my dimension colors are now magenta. This represents the fact that they are being driven by our design table now. Once all of the geometry requirements have been met, that is the sweep, and all the dimensional requirements have been met, that is the special names, next we need to add the connector points. This is found under the routing pull down for routing tools, create connection point. And I've already have a couple in here. I'll just edit the feature to show you what you would need to set for this. Okay, first would be the location, just like we did for the connector points when we were using the wizard. You could specify what type of route this is for. In this case, it's a fabricated pipe route. 
and then likewise you could select the pipe. And with that, we'll go back to the slideshow. Much like the elbow component, pipe components cannot be set up using the route component wizard either. And they too have their own special requirements. For a pipe, you must have a sketch located on the front plane, specifically named pipe sketch. And that sketch must contain two concentric circles, both centered on origin, with two dimensions named inner diameter and outer diameter respectively. The feature that will be used to generate this component must be an extrude base boss feature and it must be named extrusion. And the extrusion depth of this feature must be named length. Finally, it's required that you have a filter sketch with a single circle in it and the dimension of that circle must be nominal diameter. Tube components are very much like pipe components with similar requirements. The requirements for this tube are identical for the very first sketch, must be sketched on the front plane, two concentric circles centered on origin, name the same items as before, except the inner circle must be defined as for construction. The other difference here is that the feature to generate this component must be a sweep, and the sweep path must be a 3D sketch, normal to the original pipe sketch. And when you do this sweep feature, we want to use the thin feature to set the wall thickness. And finally, the filter sketch requirements are identical as well. And with that, we'll go ahead into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at one of these tubes. And here's my tube component. You'll notice that the feature used to generate this happens to be a sweep. Had this been a pipe component, it would have been required to be an extrusion. Both the pipe and the tube have a sketch named pipe sketch. And in that pipe sketch, we have two concentric circles, each with the dimension names outer diameter and inner diameter. The inner diameter circle must be construction geometry. That way when you go to extrude or sweep this item, that contour will be ignored. And to control the wall thickness, we'll wind up using the thin feature option as I right click on my sweep and edit feature to take a look at this. Right here is the thin feature toggle and I'm controlling my wall thickness right here. The other requirements for this tube sweep is that the path happens to be a 3D sketch and it is normal to the pipe sketch. The extrusion of the pipe, the dimension, would need to be named length. Thus, it will come into the bill material as such. We do have a filter sketch here it's required as well. This filter sketch will act like a sensor so when you drop this tube into a route assembly with other components it'll size itself based on the filter sketch in those other components. It'll try to match up. This filter sketch has a dimension specifically named nominal diameter. Had this filter sketch been for a clip then it would have been required to have three concentric circles with the dimension names of nominal diameter, inner diameter, and outer diameter. And lastly for the file properties, a configuration specific property should be set in here named pipe identifier and this property will set the default name for the component as it's dropped into your assembly. And with that, we'll go back into the slides. Now that we have all of our routing components ready to go, the next order of business is to open an existing assembly and start a route. There are three different ways that we can generate a route. We can either start by dragging and dropping of connectors or flanges. If this assembly already has routing components in it, we can right click on the connector points 
and select Start Route. Or with Solders 2007, we have the ability to create routes on the fly. That is, we can take an assembly with non-routing components, open a new route, and then generate connector points on these non-routing components. After we have our route started, we can then use our 3D sketching tools to specify the route path. Or we could ask SOLIDWORKS to help determine the path for us using the auto route tool. When doing this, sometimes SOLIDWORKS will determine a route that violates our minimum bend ratings. Therefore, we have a repair route tool along with this auto route. Additionally, we can ask SOLIDWORKS to stay along the X, Y, Z axes by checking or unchecking the orthogonal option. With it unchecked, SOLIDWORKS will generate a spline the shortest distance between the two points. When starting a route, we have to determine our route properties. These include with which tube or pipe to be used, whether or not this is a flexible route, the size of the bend radiuses, or whether or not to use an elbow component, and if we're going to use an elbow component, which one, and then on our route, whether or not we want to use a covering. And with that, we'll go into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at this. Okay, I have an assembly, and it's ready for some routing. As I open this, the first one I want to demonstrate is creating a route through the drag and drop of flanges. So if I go to my routing tools, I need to check my routing options and make sure that I'm allowing automatic route and drop of components. So I'll turn that on. Now when I go to my design library underneath the piping, I'm going to find a flange. When I drag that flange in, it'll snap into place based on its mate reference. I get to specify the configuration to use. Here it's ready to start my route. Here's the assembly name. I'm going to go ahead and point it to a folder. And I can change the name right here. I'll call this drag and drop. And now I need to set up my route properties. Currently it's using this pipe, this configuration of that pipe. And for Ben's elbows, I want it to use an elbow. And it's going to use this component here, utilizing this configuration. And with that, I'll hit OK. Now I'm in my route subassembly. I can go ahead and bring in another flange. Ask me for the configuration to use. And then with that, I can go ahead and drag these lines out and perhaps merge them together. And then SOLIDWORKS is going to throw an elbow right in that corner as I exit out of that sketch. I'm going to go ahead and save the files. There's my drag and drop route with the elbow. And if I wanted to generate a drawing with this, I'd specify new drawing, maybe bring in an isometric view, and then drop in a bill of material. And the one I'm going to use is a piping bill of material template. That way you can pull in the length. And there I have my cut length for my tubes, rather my pipes. With that, I'll go back into the assembly. The other way to begin a route is by right-clicking on existing connection points on routing components 
and starting a route. So I'll go ahead and view my routing points. And from here, if I zoom in, I'm going to find a couple of connector points. And for this connector point here, I'll right click, specify start route. SolidWorks is showing me where it wants to put it. I'll go ahead and point it to an area that I want to use. And I'll call this one start from C points. Then I get to fill out my route properties. This one's going to be a tube route, half inch, and it's going to use bends at half inch radius. Now I'll go ahead and pull my line out a little bit. Then I'll go ahead and add this connector point in here to the existing route. Right click on that connector point, add to route. Once you find the end point of that line, you can drag it out as well. And now if I want to join this with the other route, or the other leg of this route, I can right click, specify, auto route. And then from here, I just click on the end point of the other line. Notice that orthogonal is turned on. Now it's going along X, Y, Z. If I toggle this, it'll change or give me another orthogonal solution. I'll go ahead and accept that one. If I pull this out, maybe I add a dimension to finish the route. By the way, I would point out that these dimensions that I'm throwing on here, even though I have a bend, it is picking up this leg. So I'm actually going to the center of the pipe. I'll go ahead and save that. and edit the assembly again. The next way to begin a route is from the routing, maybe for piping, create a route on the fly. Here it's going to go ahead and prompt me to save it. I'll go ahead and point it to say on the fly. And now it takes me directly into my connector point tool. So I'll go ahead and zoom in. Specify that face there. I'll pick that pipe, three quarter inch schedule 40. I'll accept that there. And it's going to be a three quarter schedule 40. It's going to drop in some elbows for me. And then I'll go ahead and add this connector to the route. Then I can go ahead and throw in some 3D sketch lines from here, maybe bring it straight out. And then merge these together. Then throw some sort of dimension on here. And here. Then I'll exit the assembly. And with that, I'll save my changes and take us back into the slideshow. With SOLIDWORKS routing, you're going to use a lot of 3D sketching, so I've outlined some techniques here to save you time. When you start a line in a 3D sketch, SOLIDWORKS is going to go ahead and give you a coordinate reference.
that coordinate reference is based on your current view. So if you rotate your model, that coordinate reference will change based on whatever axes you're most close to being normal to. Or you can change the current coordinate reference with the tab button. You could also turn on the four view. And based on this four view, wherever you start drawing that line, it's going to utilize those axes as the current coordinate reference. Or if you're just trying to move and manipulate your 3D sketch, if you're on an isometric view and you start dragging on a point, it's going to move it in all three axes at once. However, if you right click on that same point and specify move with triad, this will give you control and allow you to drag it along one of the primary axes. Also in Solders 2006, they introduced the ability to generate sketch planes inside of a 3D sketch. This gives you the ability to add a reference plane by which to lay all your route lines on. And then my favorite tip here is to avoid 3D sketching altogether. I still need a 3D sketch, however, if I generate some 2D sketches, I can project them onto one another to generate my complicated 3D sketch. And with that, we'll go into SOLIDWORKS and take a look. And to show some of these 3D sketching techniques, I'll open a brand new 3D sketch. And with my line tool, right away I can see that my coordinate reference is X, Y. This is in relation to the triad in the lower left-hand corner. If I hit the tab button, I can change that reference to Y, Z, and Z, X, respectively. If I were to change my current view to, say, like the top view, I'd get X, Y. Likewise, to the front, I'd get Y, Z. Alternatively, if you take a look at your four view, if you're in the lower left-hand quadrant, it's x, y, z, x for the upper left-hand quadrant, and lower right quadrant is y, z. When I add a line in 3D space, you'll notice that there are some new relationships, like along x, y, and z, and get the cursor feedback along x, along z, and along y. If I needed to draw a line that was not normal to these three axes, I could go ahead and go into the tree. Holding the control button down, I can select a plane, and now it will line up my reference with that plane that I just selected. And hitting the tab will base the new reference on the plane I selected. And then if I hit control, I can return to the front plane, which will line it up the way it was beforehand. If I needed to draw a line at this height here on the top plane, I could double click on the top plane that activates it for the current sketch. Now any entities that I draw will wind up being on that top plane. If I need another plane reference that isn't yet been drawn, or maybe I want to base it on items in this 3D sketch, SOLIDWORKS now has the ability to add a sketch plane entity right inside the sketch. So I can reference the top plane, maybe do an offset from there. And now I can use that plane to lay my route lines on. The next item I have for us is a projected curve example. The best way to do a 3D sketch is to kind of try to avoid it altogether. I'll insert a new component and I'll name it manual route. And then I'll place it on the top plane. And for here, I'll go ahead and view normal to my sketch and drop in a spline. And I'm going to try to go through all these holes here. And I know we're kind of running short on time, so I might miss one or two of them just to kind of hurry up through this. That should be pretty close. I'm doing all right. OK, so after I've done that, I'll need to insert one more sketch. And I'll do this on the front plane and do another spline. Likewise, going through each hole, or at least near.
This one's going to look kind of awkward because I had to come back to hit it. I'm going to go through that one. Then finally, out through the top. Okay, now that I have these two sketches in here, I can project them onto one another. Do the insert, curve, projected, sketch onto sketch, this sketch onto there, and as you can see, based on my perspective from each of the 2D sketches, my curve is going through each one of the holes. So now, if I needed to make a route from this, I have a 3D curve that I could then project into a 3D sketch and use that. For route file structure, every time you add a new route, SOLIDWORKS wants to generate a new route subassembly. So unless you're intending to have a route subassembly of a route subassembly, exit the current route before beginning your next route. Bill of material considerations are that if you require items to be on the same drawing as the route, they should be in the same subassembly. This and other in-context design practices must be applied as all the parts that we're building, the tubes and the pipes, are those in-context parts. If necessary to change the size of a route, this will update the names of the pipes and the tubes. It'll change the elbow and clip configurations as well. When using clips, they need to be in the same subassembly in order for the filter sketch to resize the clip based on the route. To discuss file structure, I'll open this assembly. As you see this Ghostbusters Proton Pack, it's the file that I decided to make to help myself learn routing. I'm rather proud of it. As I scroll down through the tree here, I'm going to go ahead and show you that I chose to have a sub-assembly of all the wiring. And underneath the sub-assembly are all my route subs. And underneath each route sub-assembly is the tube component and the 3D sketch used to generate that tube component. Each one of these items are in context features based on this assembly here. And for the next component, for editing a route, to edit a route you find it in the tree, right click, specify edit route, and in this scenario here it's going through another component, so I'm going to go ahead and insert a split on this spline. So insert spline point. And then I'm going to move that point. Rather than trying to move it while I'm viewing isometric, I can right click on this spline point, specify show sketch or triad. Now I can move this along the Y axis. or the x-axis to position it precisely where I may want it. And now I can see that it's clearing my component. And with that we'll go back to the slideshow. The exports available out of SOLIDWORKS routing are a PCF export format this is for programs such as Isogen. Keep in mind if you're going to be exporting this for another package such as Isogen, there are custom properties that are required to plug into that program. We can also output text or HTML based file formats. This will create pen data tables for the route assemblies that use tubing or pipes with bends. And thank you again for joining us for another edition of DDI's Productivity Webcast Series. Don't forget to check out our podcasts available at our website, ddicad.com, or our new website for the podcasts, solidworksheard.com. Also, if you're a subscription customer, please sign up at DDI's Customer Center to gain access to this and other webcasts in our archive section. If you have any questions on this topic, please give us a call or email us at support at ddicad.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Joseph Werchter. Thanks.